I need a pool of blood. I think he's already gone. Tonight, the first images of Reese's murderer, just moments before he opened fire. Who is he? Welcome to Crime Watch. I'm here with Jane and Rav and the senior detectives from across Britain. This is your chance to make that crucial call which could have them knocking down doors tonight. In our 23 year history, you've helped solve some incredibly high profile cases. Think of the murder of James Bulger, the kidnapping of Stephanie Slater, and the deaths of Lynn and Megan Russell. Tonight, we're hoping in the next 60 minutes you'll help crack another and give Melanie and Stephen Jones some peace. Over the past few days, rumour and speculation has been rife about who killed their son, Rhys. But we're dealing with facts and evidence. And like in many of tonight's cases, CCTV footage could make all the difference. We're about to show Rhys's killer caught on camera. We ask you to be brave enough to name him. An 11-year-old boy was shot dead last night. Jones from Liverpool was hit in the neck by a single bullet. Parents of the 11-year-old was just 11 years old and with friends on his side being played football when he was gunned down close to his home. The trigger and killed Reese. An anger only deep in zero cost. It remains a mystery. He was the one who was shot the whole of the country. Reese was an outdoor type of person. He loved to play football. He loved to be anywhere but, but in the house. You wouldn't like me to tell anybody that you're struggling to go talk to me in the night. Come talk to me any time. I got you nearly 12. But yeah, he always had his arms around me. Just when he smiled, he just made you feel warm and lovely. He just made you smile back at him. And he, he liked to, he liked to think that he could make people laugh. Uh, and I used to make people laugh a lot. He was always bouncing around the house and tormenting the dog. And, but now it's oh, so quiet. It's, it's never going to be the same again. The last time I spoke to Reese was uh, I was I was sitting on the, the couch watching TV, and he'd already left for, for football with his son and on feet, uh, but he hadn't taken his subs for that particular week. And instead of paying it on the Saturday uh, before the game, uh, he decided that he'd run all the way back and badger his mother for the one pound fifty, whatever it was, for for, for his subs. Uh, so he came bursting in through the front door and sat on the arm of the, the settee, out of breath, waiting for my wife to give him his, his one pound fifty to, to head off. And I remember him sitting on the end, end, end of the couch, and I kept on thinking to myself, he needs a haircut. He needs a he needs a haircut. And uh, that was the last time. That was the last time I saw him. Was my wife running back? Yeah. Running back I got his subs and put him in the car because he was going to be late for training. And, and I, I took him up to the training field and gave him a kiss and said, "See him on my view, touch England." Seven thirty p.m. August the twenty-second. Bruce had just finished playing football up here and was walking the ten-minute journey home down Langley Close and across this pub car park. On the other side of the pub. Another boy riding his bike. But this kid, disguised in a hoodie and cap, is on his way to shoot someone. But who? Police think it could be a rival gang member who strayed onto the wrong patch. This is Reese's killer, just seconds before firing his gun. He's just a kid himself. No more than 16. Police hope new developments in picture enhancement will reveal his face. Do you know who he is? Reese crosses the verge here, while the boy on the bike rides to the corner of the pub. Somewhere in this car park is his intended target. He stops, pulls out a revolver, and fires three times. Reese takes one final step. One of the bullets hits him directly in the neck and he collapses to the ground. Reese is a coaching manager, knocked at my door. I opened the door and he just went, Reese has been shot. I went, what? He went, you need to come with me now. I just grabbed my keys and my phone and he took me up to the fair tree. And when I got there, he was just lying there in a pool of blood. 
I think he's already gone. gone. I just, just had it all to him on that car park and I did not let him go. He was flying over his kids. I said, come on, guys. Stay with me, baby. While Melanie was cradling her dying son, his killer was riding away. Who knows what was going through his mind at the time? But by mistake, he'd murdered an innocent 11-year-old. He cycles frantically away, down an alleyway and across Fir Tree Drive North, where he nearly gets himself run over. Are you the woman who was driving this red car? And then he disappears into Dan Wood, and into a tight circle of family and friends who are protecting him. You may have been panicked and scared. Are you now carrying the burden of knowing who killed Rhys? Well, this is the mother of the person who's done this. I could just plead for her to hand her son in. She must know it's him. Or she must have some suspicions about it's him. Even for his own safety, she should hand him in. We can't rest or even try to move on without this person being caught and brought to justice. We need it. That's why we need people's help to come forward. It would have been his birthday tomorrow. He would have been 12. He wanted a new phone for his birthday. Because he had a little phone, but it wasn't what he really wanted. Uh, and we always go for his birthday, we always go for Chinese. That's all we're going to do on that. Glistening eyes and cheeky face, angels halo out of place. You to me are my whole world, wrapped up special in one word. Many hours of giggling fun, you really are the one the sun. Flying freely as a bird, wrapped up special in one word. And you are now asleep at peace, wrapped up in a word that's Reese. Detective Superintendent Dave Kenny. Everyone knows about this case. It's been on all the news bulletins. There's so much speculation in the press. We have shown the killer now on CCTV tonight. Tell us who you were looking for. What we know is that the killer is aged up to 16 years of age. He's approximately 5 feet 8 inches tall. He was wearing dark clothes, and you can see yeah, on his shoulders. Yeah. Yeah. The white stripe down, down, yeah. down there. That bike is on is a mountain bike. And as you can see, he's wearing a hood up. It's got a peak on it. Um, uh, now he's been to the scene on, on that bicycle. And you still haven't found that bike? Or the weapon, have you? We not, no, we haven't. It's, it's crucial we do find those. We've got an aerial shot of where this took place. Just to, just to explain to everybody, the murderer's coming down here on his bike. He gets to about here. Just show us where Reese was walking. Reese was playing football earlier here. He would be walking in this general direction across towards the pub across this grass area, and then he walked onto the car park, which is when he'd been struck and by a bullet. this is where the shot comes across here, here aimed at person or persons here. Yes. And Reese's corpse is walking Yes, that's right. We showed him the reconstruction, and as the cyclist goes away, so as fast as he can, obviously, he nearly has a collision with a woman in a red car, yes. who still hasn't come forward. You want to speak to her. Yes. And also to people who may have had contact with the murderer just before. Or just after. That's right. It's, it's important that people who've had contact with the killer before or after the murder get in touch with us. After the, after the murder, the impact upon the killer would have been significant. He, he's not gone there to deliberately shoot me, but this has happened and it's tragic. He would have been emotionally distraught. People would have seen that. I would ask them to look at the conscious, conscience and say, you need to come forward. You need to come forward and give that information. It's only a matter of time before we come to you. I mean, they may have unwittingly helped 
this, I mean, it's just a kid, isn't he? That's right. 16. And they're unwittingly helped to not realise what had gone on. Yes. I mean, as time goes on, it gets worse for them because they become more and more involved in this crime. Mm. It's, it's important that they come to speak to us and tell us what information they possess. And it's best to say now, isn't it? The net is closing in on this kid. You've got this CCTV now, which you're working on. It's only really a matter of time. You yes, think. it's five weeks on now. We've made a lot of progress. We've, we've got some witness statements. There is some work still to be done, but it's only a matter of time before we come knocking on the door. So he needs to come forward. He does, yes. Before you do that. That's right. A lot of witnesses have come forward. You still want more people to come forward, not just with a name, but why they think it is this particular person. What kind of protection can you offer them? It's important people that have got possessed information do come to us. There are special measures that we have in place. We will come and meet you wherever you like. If you're afraid to come to the police station, we will come to you. But it's important you sit down and listen what measures we can put in place to protect your identity. But we do need that information. Don't have this on your conscience. Do the right thing and come forward tonight. 0500 600 600. And details are on our website, bbc.co.uk slash crimewatch. Or call Crime Stoppers anonymously if you want to on 0800 treble 5 treble 1. And we will keep you updated, of course, on calls as they come in throughout the programme. Now, Rav has got their mug shots, but do you know where his most wanted are tonight? OK, take a good look at this lot. First up is Jason Humble, wanted for attacking a man with an axe in Ogmore Vale, South Wales, last December. The victim was hit in the face and left with severe scarring. Humble's 42, originally from London, but has connections to Rhonda, Farnborough and Kent. He sometimes goes by the alias O'Connor. He's dangerous, so don't approach him. Now, numbers two and three are Mohammed and Rubina Marouf. They're a married couple wanted in connection with the murder of a spiritual healer, Al Hussein Jabi. His body was found in Lee Gray Park, Luton in April last year. He'd been beaten, stabbed and left for dead. Mohammed Marouf is 33 and walks with the aid of a crutch. His wife Rubina is 27. The couple left for Pakistan on the day of the murder and haven't been seen since, but have strong links to the Asian community in Luton. And George Wickens is my number four. He's wanted for two burglaries in East Sussex involving elderly victims. Wickens has a tattoo of a red Indian chief on his right arm and a dagger on his left. He's got connections to Cookfield, Hurstpear Point and Eastbourne. So, do you know where they are tonight? Then don't wait, phone us now. 0500 600 600. Or you can text us on 63399. Just type crime, space, and then your message. And don't forget, it's very important to leave that space or your text won't get through. Here we are, we are 50 minutes in and every single phone is busy already. Now, cold and calculated are just two words you might use to describe the next man we're after. And when you hear what he did to one young woman, well, you might be lost for words when we tell you how he ended his attack by taking a photo of his victim as a souvenir. I'm feeling quite happy because I haven't been out in about six months, so looking forward to the evening and meeting up with the friends as well. But come closing time, her night begins to go downhill as people are milling about outside the bar. Off camera, the teenage girl argues with her mate and upset, she starts to walk home alone. But a man joins her, offering her comfort. Police hope these three men could be key witnesses. My guy was being a bit flirty, but um, I would never trust a guy 100% that I'd just literally met anyway. So I wouldn't say I trusted him but he didn't seem to come across as somebody to really worry about at that time. I remember having like, a kiss with this guy, and to me, that's like, normal, that's what happens on a night out. So that's normally it's that, see you later, and then off you go. But he's going nowhere. His personality changes, and he starts to get aggressive. She tries to get away, but he forces her to the ground in a nearby car park. I was being raped. I'm just feeling like... I just wanted to die there, I never really, I didn't know what to do. After it happened, I was just in shock. And then I remember just seeing, the, you know, you see a figure shake and then hearing the noise, which I would know as being a camera sound. With unbelievable callousness, the man had taken a picture of his victim lying in distress before running off. Have you been shown the photo on his phone? Take a good look at the pictures CCTV cameras have taken of him. Police have a full DNA profile. They just need his name. I hate this man. I think that it's making me feel worse the fact that he didn't live in his life just normal. 
the fifth guy was off the streets, perhaps I'd be able to start doing normal things again and not being too scared to, you know, not keep locking myself away and be able to feel a bit better. Terrible for that girl. Jenny, you've been looking at this one. That's right. I mean, if you look at this teenager, Garnett, she was raped in the early hours of the 19th of June. Um, she went out on a Monday night to Brannigan's Bar in Reading uh, to celebrate the family occasion. Now, we, we saw the suspect there on the CCTV. He was in an alley off London Street. He's described as what, white, late teens, medium build, dark hair. Anything else about Yeah, I think the other thing that's worth mentioning is he was wearing a watch on his right arm, which I think is unusual. And also, we've got his DNA, so people shouldn't be afraid to ring in. We can eliminate suspects put, put forward. And there's other lads you want to talk to as well? They are. They're not accused of uh, crucial witnesses at this time. Okay. Well, of course, there's that photo taken on the mobile phone. Has it been shown? to you as some sort of grisly trophy. Please call us here in the studio if you have any information, 0500 600 600, or you can text us on 63399, type crime, space, and then your message. And if you've been a victim of a rape or any other crime, for confidential help and advice, there's the victim support line. That's on 0845 30 30 900. Coming up, the mystery surrounding the murder of the Mayfair Bunny Girl. Now, after 30 years and a DNA breakthrough, we know he's killed again. With new clues, can we catch him tonight? And one of this year's most baffling crimes, the murder of father of four, Andrew Batterton. Oh, I was about to the person to call father, and then I can have answers. Why? We'll tell you how his killer was finally caught. Next, an extraordinary case of a bogus postman who delivers a first-class beating. The level of violence used by him and his mate is certainly shocking. But they'll be the ones in for the shock tonight. The brave victim caught the entire attack on his camera. It was about ten past nine in the morning. My partner and child had just gone to school. I was the only one in the house and it was just a normal day. Two, two minutes. It's not very often we have a parcel delivered, but I just didn't think anything. I just an ordinary person. Straight away, he was a gun within a few inches of my face. His first step, he just ran the gun straight into my heart. Pain was unbelievable. The feeling, and I could feel warm blood go straight down my face, and I, I nearly passed out. And as I was passing out, he started hitting me around the head with it as well. I couldn't do anything, I just felt absolutely hopeless. Couldn't do anything. Come on! Yeah. Uh, move! Yeah, I'm gonna get stuff! Stairs! No. He just looked at your lad with all in all his stuff. And that's the only glimpse I got of the second person. Ah! Ah! Get in there! Get off the bed! Get up on the floor! <laughs> Where's the safe? Where's the safe? Where's the safe? I don't want my Jonas! Don't lie to me! Where is it? I will kill you! When you see these things happen on the table, when you've got it in the back of your head, yeah, I just told him everything, everything he wanted. I was absolutely scared for my life, yeah. 
Sorry to bother you, the other drawer on the other side of the bed. You won't be on your back. You won't be on your back. The work I'm in is basically cash anyways. But I was going to the bank that day. Uh, so this is still looking really. <laughs> What's incredible is the robbers made off with one of Mark's own videos instead of the CCTV tapes. What idiots. We've got DC Nicola Thompson here with me now, and we've just seen footage is so clear. Surely someone must be able to name them. Yeah, we've got really good descriptions. The first one, who's dressed as a postman, uh, we describe him as mixed race, South African Caribbean, with light coloured skin, um, approximately six foot tall, athletic build, with a round face, aged between 28 and 32 years old, with short black hair. And he had that jacket on, we've seen it in, in the, the film there, a blue jacket with sort of red piping. If it's not a post office jacket, jacket, it looks extremely similar to one. It does, in yeah. fact, that he brought a parcel and a clipboard with him as well. Absolutely. Second guy? Second guy, uh, he was wearing a black. Hooded and a rag top. Um, the hood, unfortunately, was pulled tight across his face, so you don't get a very small glimpse and black trousers. Okay, so not as good on him. And, and do you think, think they targeted Mark knowing that he had cash that day? At uh, this time, we're keeping an open mind about things. Okay, fantastic. Well, do you recognise either of them? Call us 0500 600 600 if you do. You could also claim a £1,000 reward for up by Crime Stoppers. Their number is 0800 555 111. Details are on the website bbc.co.uk forward slash crimewatch. In May, we asked for your help to find the killers of Mustafa Chikawi. He was battered to death at his home in Aylesbury in front of his terrified wife, Christina. Oh, <laughs> 
Hold your heart to the tank, Richard. I have any weapons. Right. Sorry. Sorry. I took him for a scan. And apparently that's when they realised he was brain dead. And it's best to switch up the machines. Well, on the night of our appeal, we received dozens of calls and we got some good leads. But six months after his death, the police are still desperately in need of that crucial bit of evidence which could see Mustafa's murderers brought to justice. Police are convinced that the answer to this lies within the local community of Aylesbury. They're sure that people know who did this, but they aren't coming forward because of misplaced loyalties. Remember, this wasn't just a burglary. This was a brutal murder, a vicious attack on two defenceless people. Look at Christina here. All the stitching around her eye. She is scarred for life. Christina's purse is still missing. Here it is. It's a brown leather pouch, black zip here, and a black zip on the top. It's about four inches by two inches, probably about that size. And the murder weapon, the spade, that hasn't been found yet either, because you know where that all went, the purses. And take a look at Christina and her grandchildren here. Lovely family scene here at Mustafa. He is very much missed. Think about the offenders. They're both white. They're in their late teens. They're in their early 20s. One five foot nine, slim, with mousy blonde hair. He was wearing a navy and beige horizontal striped jumper. The other, he's around five foot seven, with a blue hooded top. He's described as limping slightly with his left leg. That might be permanent. Might have just been on that night. We're not sure. And if someone's conscious, doesn't make them pick up the phone. Maybe a 10,000 pound reward can help. Come on, call us. 0500. 600, 600. Well, some, some good news on this next case. Back in March, we reconstructed how cyclist Jane Gauntlet was attacked by a gang of robbers on mopeds. two weeks. I don't think they thought she'd make it through the first operation and a week in they told us that they didn't think she'd make it through the evening. And I had to watch as people came in to say goodbye to me. <laughs> and family came in to say goodbye to my daughter thinking they might never see her again. Jane made an amazing recovery, is out of hospital and continuing to get better. After the appeal, police arrested one of the robbers, 17-year-old Alex Shorts. He's now been convicted of two counts of robbery and will be sentenced next month. In the early 70s, Eve Stratford was a bunny girl at the Playboy Club in London. She had a glamorous life, mixing with the likes of Sid James and Eric Morecambe. At just 22, was a successful model too. This is Eve posing for Mayfair magazine, its front cover back in 1975. It was on the top shelf of every newsagent in March that year. That was also the month she was found murdered. been to Southern Nets before. I found this one particularly horrifying. It's one that I can I'll always remember. Sir. Sir. There's a report from the Sunday affair and another one on the front desk. What's your tell him? Tell him busy trying to catch a killer. Look, tell him I'll be half hour at least. It was a Sunday respectful with a photograph of my daughter, etc saying she'd been brutally murdered. And that was the first I heard about it. I thought, honestly, that at the time, I really, really thought, because the, the police was going at it left, right, centre, and I thought, that, that, yes, they'll get these. OK. Right. 
Eve Stratford, 21 years old, professional model. Murdered in her flat in Lindhurst Drive yesterday afternoon. The injury sustained for Eve were horrific. Um, amongst the worst I've ever seen as a murder uh, investigator. Um, she'd been uh, constrained in that her hands had been tied behind her back. And there was some evidence that there'd been an attempt to tie her ankles together. Um, and her throat had been cut a number of times. I had to identify the body because my wife couldn't do it. And that was a big shock of my life, actually, but um, there we are. Um, very hard to believe, very hard to take in. Did anyone report anything sus? Um, well, the lady in the flat downstairs um, reports her movement in his flat around 4.30pm, a uh, male and a female voice, um, said she had a thump followed by silence. Any arguing? No, she was in all day looking after a kid, didn't hear anything that might might suggest a fight or a struggle. Um, she said the thump sounded like a chair falling over. And what time was this? 4.45. Well, that's about the time of her death. Is uh, she sure about the times? Uh, yes, yeah, so positive. She was watching TV, remembers what she was watching, everything. Well, we haven't got a lot to go on, so let's look at what we do know. Now, Eve was still in bed at 7 a.m. A boyfriend also was there, about to leave for work. We know Eve was a bunny girl at the Playboy Club in Park Lane. She knew a lot of high profile people, and she also worked as a model. In fact, her picture's on the front cover of this month's Mayfair magazine. Now, I want every photographer that's photographed Eve to be interviewed. I want you talking to studio owners, publishers, promoters, anyone. Let's start with her agent in Camden. He was there the day she died at about 12.30. At 2.25, he visited a publishing and promotions consultant in Bayswater. And she left there at about 2.50. And as far as we know, she was on her own. Now, her boyfriend has told us that leaving Leightonstone Station, he would have gone down Fairlock Road, right into Haymore Road, left into Essex Road, and left into James Lane, leading to her flat in Lyndhurst Drive. Of course, regular conferences were held with, with, the, with the squad, and we inquired into all kinds of uh, possibilities and anything, anything that anybody suggested was followed up on. A secret lover? I doubt it. Think about it. Why would she invite someone back to her flat for a bit of how's your father, knowing her boyfriend could come home at any time? She knows her attacker. We can only assume that because no one heard any screams or shouts. No defense wounds. Well, you could argue that she was intimidated, terrified at knife point, and did exactly as she was told. There's no sign of a false entry. I agree. I still think it's some kind of friend or acquaintance. But who? It's a great bloody mystery, that's what it is. My wife never got over and died. Um, and it's not often you see on a death certificate a broken heart. I was hoping that I'd be on a granddad. But I wasn't. Um, so, yeah, the whole family's gone. When I've gone, the whole family's gone. After exhausting all leads, the investigation to Eve's murder was wound down in March 1976. But her death has not only haunted Eve's family, it stayed with detectives who worked on the original case. Realising advances in forensics could prove key, DS Derek Carruthers, who you've just seen in our reconstruction, urged the Metropolitan Police to reopen the case. They now have. And incredibly, detectives have extracted the killer's DNA from crime scene evidence gathered and stored for over 30 years. What's even more incredible is that this has enabled them to link it to another cold case, that of a schoolgirl murdered just six months after Eve.
16-year-old girl went out with her friends for, for an evening and uh, got waylaid on her way home in an alleyway and uh, brutally murdered and uh, was found in an electricity substation where she'd been seriously assaulted. This is the alleyway which Lynn took on the night that she was attacked. It hasn't changed much in the last 30 years. The attack definitely took place here from the blood that we found at the crime scene. Lynn had been struck once over the head with a heavy object, forcibly lifted and then thrown literally over these gates. And these are the original gates, haven't changed at all. The body of Lynn was discovered the following morning by the caretaker at the local school. On the night that Lynn was attacked, a man was out walking his dog when he saw a white male walking down the alleyway. A few moments later, a couple of witnesses coming out of our house here described seeing a man, who I think it's the same, running across the Great West Way and down into the alleyway. I'm convinced this was Lynn's attacker. Not to worry, I'm sure she's fine. I, I just thought she might have stayed. Okay. Thank you. Bye. I assumed that she was staying with her friend Rosemary and for some reason or other she'd gone there, gone, you know, home with Rosemary. But then, of course, um, I phoned them up and she wasn't there and then everything happened at once. Helen, this is my daughter, Lynn Whedon. She's only 16. She didn't come home last night. I phoned her friend. She's not there. Can you help me, please? She was still alive, but only just. And she was taken to hospital where she was uh, sort of put on a life support machine. And uh, the parents had the awful decision of having to uh, decide whether or not her machine should be switched off. It would be nice to have a, you know, a final outcome to it. We upset, you know, so many people's lives. It wasn't just ours, it was lots of people. Never ever forgotten Lynn Whedon. She was a young girl, just about to set off in the prime of her life, and uh, her life was cut short by somebody's sexual greed. This is Annie Orton. You've taken up the reins in both these cases now. You've got the DNA. You know, it's the same DNA, same man in both cases. Are there other similarities as well? Yes, yeah, and obviously the level of violence used in both of these offences was horrific. I mean, we, we have played that down in reconstruction, but it shocked you. Well, it did, yes. I mean, um, Eve had had her throat cut a number of times, and young Lynn had suffered a, a sickening, horrendous blow to her head. And of course, there's a sexual motive as well. Oh, yes, clearly. I mean, these attacks are without a shadow of a doubt sexually motivated. And on both occasions, this offender, he took the, the weapon to the scene and then took it away. Yeah, very indicative of a premeditated attack. For sexual motivation. And we're talking about a knife in, in Eve's case, it's some kind of blunt instrument, maybe what, a bit of scaffolding, a bit of pipe or something. The best guess is it, it's going to be a hammer or a piece of heavy metal, yes. If you commit crimes of this magnitude, it's pretty unlikely, isn't it? Let's face it, you've done two crimes like this and then nothing else ever again. Oh, yeah, we can't discount the fact that you probably committed offences both before these acts and after it, yes. Now, we heard the reconstruction, he may have known Eve, he may not have done. In Lynn's case, he appeared to have local knowledge of the area of Hounslow. I mean, what kind of man are we looking for here? Well, we're looking for a man now who, probably on the face of it, is living a normal life, somewhere between 55 and 60, but who's kept this dark secret now for over 30 years. And I'm convinced, you know, that he's shared this secret with somebody, a friend, a partner, an ex-lover, or perhaps a cellmate. And somebody feels they can only come forward now, perhaps? Yes, we hope so, yes. Let's hope so, indeed. We can only imagine what this is doing to Eve's dad and to Lynn's parents. They've waited 30 years for answers. Don't let them wait any longer. Please call us, 0500 600 600. And uh, let me just update you on the case of 11-year-old Reese Jones that we showed you at the beginning of the programme tonight. We have had so many calls on this case, most of them coming up with one name, leading us very clearly to one person. If you rung in, with that name. We want to know why you think it's that person. We've got some very good information already, but we want more information about that name. Now, here's Ralph with some more villains caught on camera. Now, one of my all-time favourites makes a reappearance in this summer's CCTV. This bloke's a big fan of charity, but he's not a giver, he's a taker. His game, 
nicking charity boxes wherever you can find them. How desperate is that? Here he goes. Oh, not yet. Have another try. No, not quite. There we are, caught red-handed. He's thought to have nicked boxes from at least 10 shops and banks across Lancashire, and has even managed a trip to Beckles in Suffolk. Time to stop him cashing in on other people's goodwill. Name, please. My next thief's also got some nerve. He's stolen a handbag from a 77-year-old lady and he's trying to get her cash at his co-op in Warrington. When he succeeds, he cheers to his mate waiting in a car nearby. Unbelievable. While he's giving himself a pat on the back, we get a good look at him spending his victim's money. Who is he? Recognise this bloke? You should do. I'm getting sick of the sight of him. He's already been on the programme twice and he's still at it. He's done over 20 bookings across the country. A regular man of mystery, he's got an interesting array of disguises. Look one, high of his vest and woolly hat. Look two, the trusty old cap and fleece. And then there's the fishing hat. Lovely. But whatever the season, sunglasses reign supreme. Not sure about the crush though. Always armed with a gun, always in a hurry. Come on, we've got to get him this time. A man gambling on a machine at the bookies on the Edgware Road in London. What could be strange about that? Not much until he starts checking out the place and then he can't stop. Nice move, mate. It looks like he's winding himself up, but he's actually biding his time before calling the cashier over to check the machine. He grabs the cash and runs for the door. She follows, but is thrown across the room, breaking her wrist. How brazen can you get? He's believed to be a regular at the betting shops around Paddington and Marble Arch. If you've seen him, dancing or not, call us. The two men in hoodies are also prepared to lash out. They're part of a gang of four, raiding the walkabout in Brighton. They've dragged the manager out of bed and stabbed him in the leg before demanding money from the safe. This one's so sure of himself, he's taking his hood off, so we get a good close-up. Still not satisfied, they march to the boss and the deputy manager downstairs at gunpoint and then turn on the customers. They thought they could stab a man, rob a pub and get away with it. Let's prove them wrong. So, no one even, you know what to do. 0500 600 600. Or you can text us on 63399. Just type crime, space, and then your message. And if you need to have another look at tonight's CCTV, it's on our website, bbc.co.uk forward slash crime watch. In July, James set out on a manhunt to find this man, Leslie Finch. He's a sexual predator wanted for abusing young girls. When this case came into our office and I saw the details, I was absolutely horrified. I deal with sexual abuse cases every day, but this one just really stood out. While these children have suffered at the hands of this man, I just can't begin to describe. It felt like when he was doing it, it was like a gnat going all over your body. And then coming back for more. You know when a gnat goes over your body, and it bites you and then goes away. It felt like that. My dream would be for him to get caught and have to pay for what he's done. And everyone to know that people can't trust him. To know for definite that it couldn't happen to anyone else would be a massive relief. Jane, when we did this on the night, we had over 50 calls. I mean, I was almost certain, I don't know about you, that we got this guy. I mean, one called Lorraine and said, we're finished with million workers. Yes, right, yeah, a massive response. And it was so good that officers went straight round to a location. When they got there, he had fled. He'd taken his jacket and his mobile phone. We don't know whether he watched the programme or whether somebody tipped him off. But when we've got to his flat that he was living in, he left all his possessions behind. So he's left in a hurry. And he's scarfed. Now, how has he survived it? Because he hasn't touched his bank account. Has That's he? right. We know he had connections with the building trade. Um, and believe it or not, he's actually been touching his services, trying to earn some money in the streets in UK. And this is the card that he's, um, he's been handing out. Um, offering his DIY services. And he is certainly not the kind of man you would want to hire for a bit of DIY around the home. Someone's tipped you off that he's had a tattoo done there. He has, and it's a very distinctive tattoo. It's a, of a, an American Indian with feathers and a headpiece, black in colour, and it's on his upper right arm. And he's still coming out with his fanciful stories. Now he's stating he's an ex-Marine and was in Iraq. Well, he's very likely to reoffend. And I have to say, if you come across this man, Leslie Finch, don't waste a minute, pick up the phone now, 0500 600 600. Now over to Rav with some more wanted men. Well, my number five is Chima Enianwu, 
wanted for supplying cocaine. He's originally from Nigeria, but was living in Bolton when he escaped to arrest. He's now thought to be hiding out in London. Now, two years ago, almost to the day, Anthony Kavanagh was murdered. He was a Royal Navy seaman on shore leave and was attacked in a bar in Fleet Street, Liverpool. Now, police want to speak to this man, David Corkill, my number six. Corkill was 25, originally from Liverpool, and he's known to travel throughout the North West. Number seven is Michael McKell, and he's wanted for making threats to kill, and he's also a registered sex offender. He's six foot and has a gold hoop in his left ear. Originally from Dumbarton, he's got a strong Scottish accent and has links to Glasgow, Fleetwood, Oldham and Birmingham. And last, but by no means least, is my number eight, Damien Foley. He's wanted in connection with an attack on a man with a samurai sword. The victim was stabbed several times and left with serious injuries. Foley is 41 and known in the Watford and Oxy areas of Hertfordshire. So have you seen Foley or any of the others? Get dialing 0500 600 600. You know, it always takes a huge amount of courage for the victims of crime and their families to speak out. And the mother in our next case is no different. She was targeted at home in Wigan by someone who wanted to set her and her two young children on fire. It's just after 11pm on Monday the 9th of July in Greenwood Avenue in Wigan when this man comes calling. He's carrying half a concrete paving slab and a bottle of creosote, living at the address a mum her two young children. The man starts smashing the side window with the concrete. Step back and I'm trying to get away. The glass hit me. Never think it's to kill so. Christine was left with a nine inch gash in her arm and damage to tendons and nerves. Her children were terrified, but the ordeal didn't stop. The attacker threw creosote into Christine's eyes. At the time, she thought it was a petrol. I said to my little lad, call me in the cliff. Who is this monster? And here he is again as he calmly leaves the crime scene. Christine needed several operations. She'll be scarred for life. I can't think of any why someone would do that. Well, do you see Pete Morris? What struck me, and I'm sure it's going to strike everyone at home, is, is you think, you know, surely Christine must have known this man. Why would he pick on her? I'm completely satisfied that Christine doesn't know this person or the family of Christine. He's a complete stranger. I mean, we can tell as he walks along, he's, he's about six foot or over the way he bends down to open the gate. He's white. He had some kind of mask on, it might have been homemade, we can't be sure. And you think he's local, don't you? Yeah, we do, uh, because the fact is he tried to disguise his voice during the uh, CCTV, but then changed his back to local Wigan accent. Yes, and Christy picked that up very strongly, didn't he? He did, yes. And then he was trying to throw creosote, I mean, terrifying, into the home. He spilled quite a lot of creosote over his clothes, you can tell that, can't you, from the CCTV? You can, you can't see that. He must have reeked of the stuff afterwards, wasn't he? Well, he would have done, yes, like I say. He would have had to go home at 11 o'clock at night you know, like I say, it was strong, smelt very strong of creosote, and uh, somebody, family must know that this, who this person is. Exactly, or maybe he's washing his clothes, trying to dispose of his yeah, clothes. Yeah. What about this paving slab that he tried to break in with it? There's something pretty distinctive about it, isn't there? Well, there is, yeah. It's a hexagon type flag, uh, it's broken in half. But on there, you can see there's been some type of light fitting or some sort of decorative ornament on there. That's been removed? Yes, it's been removed at some point, yeah. Perhaps there's somebody been trying to renovate the garden at some point and they've disposed of that even in the garden or a skip. But I do need to know where that flag has come from. OK, well, call us tonight, 0500 600 600, or call Crime Stoppers on 0800 555 one. Earlier, you heard the heartbreaking plea of Rhys Jones's mum, Melanie. In April, another mother spoke out on Crime Watch about her son, Adam Regis. He was also an innocent boy. He was also murdered on his way home. But you've seen it seven times? Yeah, because I love that film. I'm going to get it when it comes out of the Two doctors came in. He said to me, I'm so sorry. I was 
I need to save him. Oh, and I don't want sorry. I just want him back. <laughs> I just want him back. Since our last appeal, police are making good progress. Remember, Adam was killed shortly after 9.30pm on the 17th of March on Kingsland Road, Class O, East London. At least five guys are believed to be linked to Adam's murder and are seen fleeing the scene in this car. We identified the cars as Sirocco in May, but now, thanks to you, we know the cars as VW Mark II Sirocco and have narrowed it down to being bronze in colour. This is what it looks like. This isn't the actual one that will look like this. There are less than 200 of them in the country and police have tracked down some, but not all of them, so we need to eliminate the rest. Do you drive one or do you know of one? Perhaps it's been painted in a different colour or taken off the road. There's a huge reward to bring Adam's killers to justice. 20 grand. We're not giving up on this one. Please call 0500 600 600. Nine months ago, Terry, Katie, Danielle and Andrew were left orphaned when their dad was murdered. Andrew Batten, known to his friend and family as Fatter, was stabbed to death in his home in Cheshire. The case had everyone baffled. Queen. I just got mad over that Mr. Ocarl Queen. <laughs> That's what I did. I miss everything, just money back. It's been a bit like, what's this going to hold? Thousand Octus, the person to come forward. And then I can have answers. Why? Mum did get an answer. Her son's murderer is this man, 40-year-old Stephen Moultrum, Fatter's girlfriend's ex-partner. Infatuated and jealous, he stabbed Fatter in a premeditated act of revenge. After the murder, Moultrum bombarded Fatter's girlfriend with phone calls. Police became suspicious and they took his DNA. It matched the DNA found on Fatter's bedroom window when the killer got in. The evidence against Moultrum proved overwhelming and in court, he pleaded guilty to murder. When I saw him in the car, he was like, just hanging his head, like, showing all the mass. Just like... Like, everyone had to feel sorry for him. When the judge said, guilty, I looked at the family. And I just come, yes. And I smiled, and I looked straight at them. Just a relief. Everything was just like it's over. Everything's over. I know why. I know everything. Justice has been done. He's lost everything. Like we've lost everything. Hearing Fatter's mum and daughter there, it's clear how getting justice is so important to families. So let's hope tonight your calls will lead to other families finding some comfort. So, Rab, what's coming tonight? Lots and lots of stuff, actually, on almost all of the calls, especially Rhys Jones, the poor 11-year-old murdered in Liverpool. We've had lots of names, in particular lots of the same name coming forward on him, and we may have even traced the woman in that red car that we saw from the film. More on the update. If you know of anything, please give us a call. Details on tonight's cases are on our website. If you want to check them out, bbc.co.uk slash crimewatch. Our phone lines are open until midnight tonight and from 7.30 in the morning to midnight tomorrow. Crimewatch next month, Tuesday the 30th of October. But don't go away now. We'll be back in half an hour with a Crimewatch update. So if you know who killed little Reese, or you have any information that could help with tonight's appeals, please pick up the phone now. Your call could be the one that makes a difference. See you at 10.35 for now. Tonight, the first images of Reese's murderer just moments before he opened fire. Who is he? Hello, and 
and welcome to Crime Watch. I'm here with Jane and Rav and the senior detectives from across Britain. This is your chance to make that crucial call which could have them knocking down doors tonight. In our 23-year history, you've helped solve some incredibly high-profile cases. Think of the murder of James Bulger, the kidnapping of Stephanie Slater, and the deaths of Lynn and Megan Russell. Tonight, we're hoping in the next 60 minutes you'll help crack another and give Melanie and Stephen Jones some peace. Over the past few days, rumour and speculation has been rife about who killed their son, Rhys. But we're dealing with facts and evidence. And like in many of tonight's cases, CCTV footage could make all the difference. We're about to show Rhys's killer caught on camera. And we ask you to be brave enough to name him. An 11-year-old boy was shot dead last night. Jones from Liverpool was hit in the neck by a single bullet. The parents of the 11-year-old was just 11 years old boy. and with friends on his side, he played football when he was gunned down close to his home. The and killed Rhys. Anger only deepens here. It remains a mystery. He was one who was shot the whole of the country. Rhys was an uh, outdoor type of person. He loved to play football. He loved to be anywhere but, but in the house. You wouldn't like me to tell anybody that you just like me to go talk to me night. Come and talk to me any time. I go, you're nearly 12. But yeah, he always had his arms around me. Just, when he smiled, he just made you feel warm and lovely. He just made you smile back at him. And he, he, liked, to, he liked to think that he could make people laugh. Uh, and he used to make people laugh a lot. He was always bouncing around the house and tormenting the dog. And, but now it's all oh, so quiet. It's, it's never going to be safe again. The last time I spoke to Reese was uh, I was I was sitting on the, the couch watching TV, and he'd already left for, for football with his son and on feet. Uh, but he hadn't taken his subs for that particular week. And instead of paying it on the Saturday uh, before the game, uh, he decided that he'd run all the way back and badgered his mother for the one pound fifty, whatever it was, for for, for his subs. Uh, so he came bursting in through the front door and sat on the arm of the, the settee, out of breath, waiting for my wife to give him his, his one pound fifty to, to head off. And I remember him sitting on the end, end, end of the couch, and I kept on thinking to myself, he needs a haircut. He needs a he needs a haircut. And uh, that was the last time, that was the last time I saw him, because my wife brought him back. Yeah, yeah. I got him his subs and put him in the car because he was going to be late for training. And I took him up to the training field and gave me a kiss and said, see him on my bed, to watch England. 7.30pm, August the 22nd. Reese had just finished playing football up here and was walking the 10 minute journey home down Langley Close and across this pub car park. On the other side of the pub, Another boy riding his bike. But this kid, disguised in a hoodie and cap, is on his way to shoot someone. But who? Police think it could be a rival gang member who straightened into the wrong patch. This is Reese's killer, just seconds before firing his gun. He's just a kid himself no more than 16. Police hope new developments in picture enhancement will reveal his face. Do you know who he is? Reese crosses the verge here, while the boy on the bike rides to the corner of the pub. Somewhere on this car park is his intended target. He stops, pulls out a revolver, and fires three times. Reese takes one final step. One of the bullets hits him directly in the neck and he collapses to the ground. Reese is in. Coach and manager knocked at my door. I opened the door and he just went, Reese has been shot. I went, what? You went, you need to come with me now. I just grabbed my keys and my phone and he took me up to the fair tree. And when I got there, he was just lying there in a pool of blood. I think he's already gone. I just had to hold him on that car park and... I didn't want to let him go. He was just lying there with his kids. I said, come on, he's... Stay with me, baby. 
While Melanie was cradling her dying son, his killer was riding away. Who knows what was going through his mind at the time, but by mistake, he'd murdered an innocent 11-year-old. He cycles frantically away, down an alleyway and across Fir Tree Drive North, where he nearly gets himself run over. Are you the woman who was driving this red car? And then he disappears into Dan Wood and into a tight circle of family and friends who are protecting him. He may have been panicked and scared. Are you now carrying the burden of knowing who killed Reese? Well, it's the mother of the person who's done this. I would just plead for her to hand her son in. She must know it's him. Or she must have some suspicions about it's him. Even for his own safety, she should hand him in. We can't rest or even try to move on without this person being caught and brought to justice. We need it. That's why we need people's help to come forward. It would have been his birthday tomorrow. He would have been 12. He wanted a new phone for his birthday. Because he had a little phone, but it wasn't what he really wanted. Um, and we always go off for his birthday. We always go for the I don't know what we do on that. Glistening eyes and cheeky face. Angels halo out of place. You to me are my whole world, wrapped up special in one word. Many hours of giggling fun, you really are the one the sun. Flying freely as a bird, wrapped up special in one word. And you are now asleep at peace, wrapped up in a word that's Reese. Speculation in the press. We have shown the killer now on CCTV tonight. Tell us who you're looking for. What we know is that the killer is aged up to 16 years of age. He's approximately 5 feet 8 inches tall. He was wearing dark clothing, and you can see on his front. Yeah, the white stripe down there. That bike he's on is a mountain bike, and as you can see, he's wearing a hood up. It's got a peak on it. Um, uh, now he's been to the scene on, on that bicycle. And you still haven't found that bike? All the weapon, have you? We no, we haven't, and it's, it's crucial we do find out. We've got an aerial shot of where this took place. Just to, just to explain to everybody, the murder was coming down here on his bike. He gets to about here. It just shows where Reese was walking. Reese was playing football earlier here. He would be walking in this general direction across towards the pub, across this grass area, and then he walked onto the car park, which is when he'd been struck by a This is where the shot comes across here, here aimed at person or persons here. Yes. And Reese is caught as he's walking. Yes, that's right. We showed him the reconstruction as the cyclist goes away so as fast as he can, obviously. He nearly has a collision with a woman in a red car yes. who still hasn't come forward. You want to speak to her. Yes. And also to people who may have had contact with the murderer just before or just after. That's right. It's, it's important that people who've had contact with the killer before or after the murder get in touch with us. After the, after the murder, the impact upon the killer would have been significant. He, he's not gone there to deliberately shoot me, but this has happened and it's tragic. He will have been emotionally distraught. People will have seen that. I would ask them to look at the conscious, conscience and say, you need to come forward. You need to come forward and give that information. It's only a matter of time before we come to you. I mean, they may have unwittingly helped this. I mean, it's just a kid, isn't it? That's right. 16. They may have unwittingly helped and not realise what had gone on. Yes. I mean, as time goes on, it gets worse for them because they become more and more involved in this crime. Yeah. It's important that they come to speak to us and tell us what information they possess. And it's fair to say now, isn't it? The net is closing in on this kid. You've got this CCTV now, which you're working on. 
It's only really a matter of time. Yes, yes. It's, it's five weeks on now. We've made a lot of progress. We've, we've got some witness statements. There is some work still to be done, but it's only a matter of time before we come knocking on the door. So he needs to come forward. He does, yes. Before you do that. That's right. A lot of witnesses have come forward. You still want more people to come forward, not just with a name, but why they think it is this particular person. What kind of protection can you offer them? It's important people that have got possessed information do come to us. There are special measures that we have in place. We will come and meet you wherever you like. If you're afraid to come to the police station, we will come to you. But it's important you sit down and listen what measures we can put in place. Thank <laughs> you.